In this video, we're going to look at an introduction of some of the concepts involved when you get into the 3D modeling side of the Aspire program. Firstly, let's talk about how we represent the 3D data. Essentially, what we're looking at is a grid of pixels and each one of these pixels is at a different Z height. And so the concept is exactly the same as the executive pin art toy, where you have the pins that you can push a 3D shape into them and see that represented by the different heights of the pins being pushed up. And the difference with Aspire is that we are using a million or more points so we can represent much more complex and smooth forms. Now we don't actually see each individual location and in the software we refer to these points as pixels and this really is the same terminology that you may have heard when people describe the points or dots that make up a 2D image. And this really is the same concept. The more dots you have, the better quality image you have. And so in the software, the more pixels you have, the better quality the model that you will have. The quality setting in the software is referred to as resolution. And you define this when you start a new session in the job setup form under the modeling resolution as highlighted here. By default, we're presented with three options for this. First is your standard resolution. So this is where we apply 1 million pixels over the surface of your entire work area. And we have high resolution. This is where we have 2 million pixels and we have a very high resolution. And this is 4 million pixels over the surface of your entire work area. And so this really presents us with a trade-off because the higher the settings mean that we'll get a better quality model. However, it may mean that there may be longer calculation times for some modeling and toolpathing operations. So you just have to balance it out so it's appropriate for the type of work that you're doing and the computer hardware that you are running. Now, resolution does not affect 2D or 2.5D content. That's all down to the quality of the vectors that you've drawn and the settings that you use in the toolpaths. For people who are new to this concept, it can be a little bit difficult to understand. So let's have a look at some of the rules for success. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to maximise the area of the job that the 3D part covers. So you don't want to have lots of space in your job that is actually irrelevant to what you're actually machining. And so a good idea is to make the job size slightly larger than the part that you actually plan to toolpath. And the reason for this is that you want to leave enough border for your cutout tool to go around. So you can see in the image here, we've got this 3D model or this horse head and the rectangle that actually surrounds this horse is that of the job size. Okay. Now, what we don't want to do is we don't want to make the job size the size of the table or the material, unless it's the size of the part that you're actually cutting. So let's have a look at the two examples that we've got here. So at the top, we have the horse's head that's 10 inches wide and it's positioned within a job space that is actually 12 inches wide. And so it's just a little bit bigger than the part that we've actually planned to cut. Now at the bottom over here, we have that same 10 inch horse, except that this time it's actually placed in a job size that is actually four foot by eight foot. And if we look to the right, we can see the quality difference that it makes to both of these models. At the top here, you can see that we've got a very high quality model and that's because we're maximizing the number of pixels within this work area so that the model can use that to get all of that definition. Now at the bottom over here, because we're covering such a large area, we're actually getting much fewer of those points underneath our model. And so we can see that we're really sacrificing the quality of the model if we do that. 
So it's very important to maximise the area of the job that the 3D area covers and a good idea is to look at the parts that you plan to toolpath and add in an inch or a couple of centimetres around the parts assuming it's large enough to accommodate any cutout operations that you plan to do. And in some situations, you may want to look at rotating the parts to best fit the shape of the material in order for you to maximise the number of pixels being used. And this is something to think about if it appears that there is lots of white space. So once the part is set up, what is it that tells the software to push these pixels up to different Z heights? We use a concept called components. Components are the words that we use to refer to the 3D objects in the software. When we create these components, that's going to push up the pixel heights in the software and by combining these together is how we get the overall finished object, where these are all managed in the component tree on the modeling tab as highlighted in the image on the right hand side. And the result of all of these individual objects combined together is what gives us something that we refer to as the composite model. And so this could just be a single component on a level, or it could be like the example that we've got here, where we have an assembly of many levels, groups and components. And this is what you see in the 3D view as a result of all of these components and their combined modes, how they're interacting with each other is what gives us the finished part. And that's what we're going to machine. So how do we generate these components? Now there are a couple of ways to do this. So one way is that we could use the model and tools in Aspire to create the different types of shapes. Now the model making tools that are available can be found on the top section of the modeling tab highlighted in this image here. And this is where we'd go to create our components. Or we could look at using the create shape tool where you can take a vector and you can look at building that into a round, angled, flat, bell, or even custom made profile shapes. You could also look at using the two rail sweep or the extrude and weave tool to create swept shapes. We could also even look at using the turn and spin tool to create spun and rotated shapes. We could also look at using the sculpting tools whereby we can edit a shape as if it were virtual clay. We also have the create texture area tool that will enable us to create pattern components. And then we have this option here to add in a zero plane that will just create a flat plane that has a height of zero. We also have the ability to create a model from an image and this is good for generating component textures. And an alternate way to build in shapes from 2D data in the software is to go ahead and import the 3D model. Now this may be something that you've previously made in Aspire and saved it out, or it could be a piece of 3D clip art that you've purchased or downloaded from the internet, or it could be a 3D model created in another CAD program that you may want to bring in and finish and then create the toolpaths to cut it out on your CNC. So by working through all of the other modeling tutorials, you'll learn how to use each of these functions and how to use the 3D editing functions and how to import and work with 3D data that's been created from external packages. Now, when you're creating your job, what's your typical workflow? So the first thing that you're going to do is to define your job concept and gather your reference material. So maybe this is information from your customer or it could be things that you just bring together to begin your design. Then you need to create good quality vectors. All 3D work will benefit from good quality vectors. Everything that you've learnt about vectors so far will ultimately help you to create good quality models. So the better the vectors, the better the model. And so with those vectors, you'll begin to build the basic components with the modeling tools.
And as you build more shapes, you'll need to organise your components into sub-assemblies, whereby you'd look at levels and groups. You can adjust the order of the combined modes and these components to slowly build a more complex shape. And that's all managed in the component tree. Now as you're doing this, you may use some of the editing tools to start to smooth and blend the components together to get the shapes to interact with each other just the way that you want. As with any project, iterate through where you may make changes for improvement until you get to the point where you have a part that's ready to machine. But you may want to apply some finishing touches, for instance, sculpting or smoothing and everything you need to do to get it machine ready. So now that we've got the 3D part in a state that's now ready to machine, it's time to think about creating the toolpaths to cut this out on a CNC. Now the most common approach to machining 3D parts is by using two different toolpaths, where we'd look at using the 3D roughing and the 3D finishing toolpaths. Now the 3D roughing toolpath removes the majority of the material around the part using a larger tool and it keeps it slightly away from the finished object to make sure that we've got some material left for the second type of toolpath which is the 3D finishing toolpath and this is what cuts the finished surface of the model using a smaller tool with a smaller step over and so that step over is the distance between each path that the tool makes. So if we take a look at the images that we've got here, you can see that the top example is an example of some theatre masks that have been roughed out using the 3D roughing toolpath. Where it's hogged away a lot of the material ready for us to go in with a smaller tool where we would apply a 3D finishing toolpath. And with a 3D finishing toolpath, we would use a very small step over. And you can see that we've got the actual preview here of the toolpath itself within this image. And so here you can see that the lines are very close to each other. And then the result of this is the actual finished cutout, which you can see at the bottom here. And so the smaller the step over, the better the quality the finish will be. The penalty for this is that it's going to take longer to cut out. As well as doing 3D toolpaths, you may want to combine these with 2D and 2.5D toolpaths. For example, you may want to run a 2D profile to cut around your 3D part. There are some 2D and 2.5D toolpaths that can also be projected onto a 3D shape. For example, I may want to cut out a model of a banner, so I'd run my 3D toolpaths first, and then using a V-bit, I could project the text onto the model with the V-carve toolpath. In addition to creating a 3D model to output to a CNC, you may want to export the 3D model to import into another CAD program. You may also want to export it to a 3D printer where you could save the model as a mesh so that you can 3D print it. You may also want to export the 3D model as a 2D grayscale. Some lasers cut grayscales as a dimensional object. So this concludes this quick overview of the general concepts behind modelling in Aspire and the typical workflow that we're going to use with it. Now, if you want to do this sort of work, then we definitely recommend that you watch all of the 3D modelling tutorials that we have available. And we'll link you to some of those in the related videos section for this tutorial.